In the first part of this set of videos, we covered how magic is approached and used by the wizards of Discworld. In this video, we will be exploring it as it employed by the other main magical practitioners on the disc, the witches. A witch is always female, and always identifiable by her hat, which is pointed and black, as well as often by wearing a black cloak. While most choose to wear all black clothing as well, this is not a rule, and indeed some younger witches sue even the hat as well if they feel they are not comfortable being part of the traditional imagery of witchcraft. This is because unlike wizards that we discussed last time, witches are individualists to a woman. What makes one truly a witch is what lies in your mindset and your determination, what you instinctively do in the face of a crisis, with magical aptitude often seen as a useful bonus rather than a mandatory component. This is all down to the fact that, to a witch, magic is the last and final resort. Within the communities of the Round Tops and the surrounding area, as well as a few scattered across the Stowe Plains and in Überwald, the witch fulfills the role of the herbalist, doctor, midwife, veterinarian, therapist, and mortician to her community. Their main tool, however, is headology. This is used by witches to earn respect, or at least fear, and also to cure patients. The power of headology is not to be underestimated, and could be seen as similar to psychology, but a witch would not appreciate that comparison. Clearly, the way a person sees himself or herself and the surrounding world forms that person's reality. If this view is changed effectively through the use of headology, then this person's reality changes. This allows the witches to make people think they are frogs, for example, which is less messy and generally a lot more fun than actually transforming someone. It can also be used to disguise more complex medicines, such as when Granny Weatherwax, the foremost headologist on the Discworld, fixes an elderly patient's back problems with a bottle of faux potion and some stealthy chiropractic in the beginning of the novel Masquerade. This is such an excellent scene that I would encourage anyone who hasn't read it for themselves to do so, as I feel that my attempting to surmise it here would do a serious disservice to the book. That is not to say that witches are incapable of using true magic in the way a wizard would see it. They can and do have such potential and have a number of tricks up their sleeves. Across the series, witches have displayed levels of telekinetic power, for example. Particularly notable examples being Granny Weatherwax, who once exploded fellow witch Githa Og's hat when someone was unwise enough to claim that she lacked any real magical power herself. She was also able to engage in a protracted magical duel with Q-Tangle, the Arch-Chancellor of Unseen University at the time, which itself speaks volumes for what witches, when pushed, are quite capable of. Another common skill that witches display that is definitely magical in nature is that of borrowing. When borrowing, a witch sends her mind into an animal and watches the world through its eyes, riding in its mind like an unobtrusive passenger. A witch might do borrowing when she's bored and wants to ride out in the forest animal's mind for a little while, but it is more commonly used to gain surveillance on their areas of responsibility, making use of animals' more keen senses in the night time, for example. There is an inherent risk to borrowing, however. Be away too long, become too involved in the animal, and the witch's mind might forget to come back to her body and get stuck in the animal, and then the mind will slowly lose its humanity and the witch will become nothing more than a few vaguely human thoughts in the animal's mind. After a few mere minutes of borrowing and then successfully turn to her body, even a powerful witch may be influenced to act like the animal that she was riding. It is not uncommon for a witch who has just returned from borrowing a bird's mind to decide to fly down the stairs instead of walking, or to prefer food associated with her evening's assistant. It is considered among witches who borrow regularly that they should pay back, leaving a small suggestion in the mind of the animal that they should come to the cottage, at which point they will find a meal that just happens to have been left outside the garden fence. Of course, there is a reason witches do not, in fact, use their magic as freely as a wizard would, that being the very real fear of going cackling. A witch's responsibility is, when you get right down to it, to solve problems. If she tries to solve all her problems with magic, it would be easy, but magic always has a price. You may consider it a cost worth paying, however, and so you do it for all your problems, more and more of them, and you begin to slide down. When you start thinking that you know better than everyone else, so you might as well run their lives for them. And if they don't like it, well, I suppose that just makes them a problem as well, and by now, you just solve all your problems with magic, and these ignorant fools would look so much better as a frog or a cockroach, and yes, why not? Transforming your cottage into gingerbread just makes so much sense, and you could just get one of those nice big ovens just right for the pair of children you saw out and about on the evenings. <laughs> uh, 
Ah, and so a witch begins cackling. It is particularly dangerous for witches living alone, which is why they maintain such social lifestyles among other witches. Nobody wants to see another witch go to the bad. Nobody wants to see you start cackling. Isolated witches with no one to talk to who go to the bad are the source of most of the nasty rumours and superstitions that surround all of witchcraft, so you may be sure that there are none so keen to deal with the cackling witch as her own sisters of the craft. Related to the magic of witches, there are also the use of broomsticks. In truth, one does not need to be a magical practitioner to actually make use of one of these tools, as they are enchanted objects in their own right. But being a witch does mean you can refuel the magic in your own stick without needing to pay the doubtlessly exorbitant fee that would be charged by a wizard or the dwarfs who specialise in making broomsticks as a signature mode of transport to the witch. They are indeed invaluable in rural communities, as they allow the witch to go where she is needed without worrying about working her way through rough woodland or hilly ground at a speed a good deal faster than she would if she were walking. And in a job where speed can be life or death with the sick patients in your care, broomsticks can indeed be a highly precious tool. As to how witches are recruited, if a girl shows aptitude, she will be found by one of the witches, often a witch who specialises in looking for such potentials, and with their parents' permission, though lies of omission are not uncommon, as in the case of Tiffany Aching, when she first went to train under the witch Mrs. Level, her mother was put under the impression that she was going to learn to work in service for an elderly lady. It is not uncommon for girls to change mentors among witches if the local senior witches feel that they would learn better under a specific teacher, or if their teacher dies of old age before their training can be completed. However, this level of organisation is surprisingly recent. That is not to say that it has not always been the case, but at least by the time we are introduced to the witches in the novel Weird Sisters and then the follow-up Witches Abroad, we are painted a very clear picture that the witches in the Ram Tops are in decline with fewer and fewer witches who die, doing so with successors able to take up their places, requiring those that remain to patch up where they can and take on increasingly more duties to ensure that all the villages in the area are covered. This continued all the way up until the events of Carpe Jugulum, which was our last proper look at the witches for a whole six novels. The gap that comprised around six round world years and a three year time gap within Discworld itself. This time gap can be guessed by some degree by looking at the stories surrounding the events. The birth of the witch Magrat Garlic's daughter, which occurs a couple of weeks before the events of Carpe Jugulum. And then, in the next book, The Fifth Elephant, Samuel Vimes of the City Watch learns that his wife is pregnant, a birth that occurs in the book Night Watch, which is the book directly before We Free Men, which is where we return to the witch's story. This gives us solid evidence that one year elapses between the two books roundabout, give or take a couple of months. In the time gap, the witches, following the events of the vampiric takeover of Lancre, seem to make a conscious effort to rebuild and reorganise. For myself, I believe we only see the beginnings of this in We Free Men as the witch finder Miss Tick is actively looking for new girls to recruit into witchcraft and, two years after that, during the events of Hatful of Sky, a time difference that is explicitly stated within that book as Tiffany Aching herself is two years older, we see that the witches are at their strongest and most active we have seen them in all of Discworld's history, including the growth of their annual meetings known as the Witch Trials, an event in which the witches traditionally display their level of ability to each other, growing into a large festival for the whole Lankra community to enjoy, becoming more and more organised as the witches in the area reached out to others in nearby areas, and establishing more regular communications and the selecting of the training of new girls to become witches becoming more formalised. To my mind, it seems to me that this renaissance most likely came from the prodding of the leader that witches don't have, the aforementioned Esmeralda Weatherwax. Following the close shave in Lankra experienced at the hands of the Magpier Vampire Clan and her own role in the events, realising that witchcraft's decline had to cease, she began poking the right people and gaining their support and agreement, and managed to get the art of witchcraft back on its feet and stronger than ever. All that being said, Mistress Weatherwax isn't exactly keen on all aspects of the return to strength, especially the publicity of the witch trials to which she is particularly sensitive to the fact that children are now brought in regular attendance. Quite why she considers this a bad thing isn't explicitly stated, but as an old woman she often can't be having with any of that. None of this is ever outright stated in official source, you understand, but this is my best and most likely interpretation of events as I see them. I would like to thank people on the Discworld subreddit as well in particular for helping me work through all this in recent weeks. Some witches will also specialise themselves in a certain role or function, such as the young Petulia Gristle, 
who is the leading expert in pig care in the Ramtops, or Miss Treason, an elderly blind witch who dispenses justice, solving disputes in her community with some added flair and showmanship to keep her edge as a mystical and mysterious crone. In keeping with their nature as individualists, witches do not have organised training regimes or specific rules to follow. A witch trains her own successor to take over her own steading, the village or villages under her jurisdiction of care. This does indeed extend to the denominations of witches that I just mentioned, and there are a distinct number of types who will train their own successors, which we will go through now. Witch finders are witches who specialise in travelling around small rural communities and finding girls with the aptitude for witchcraft to learn how to harness their potential. They tend to operate in areas without established witches already, in order to hopefully allow the trained local girl to return once her training is complete and provide for her own family and neighbours. This has the dual purpose of spreading witchcraft to where it is needed and preventing accidents, as girls who are capable of tapping into witches' magic who go untrained could potentially be dangerous to themselves and the community around them as they will most likely end up going cackling. Witch finders are natural survivalists, a much needed trait if one goes into an area without, without any real understanding of what witches really are, and upon finding one will most likely throw them in a pond or lake. Research witches are those who dedicate themselves to learning the finer points of the craft. How exactly do spells, potions, pulses, and other useful aids work? What type of deadly nightshade flower? What size of knife? Do you collect it at what hour of dawn? While such witches tend to be worse at headology than others who play it by ear, they do tend to end up making much better doctors, for perhaps self-evident reasons. An edge witch is one who deals in edges, any edges, where boundary conditions apply, the edge between life and death, light and dark, good and evil, today and tomorrow, this world and the next, the list goes on. A witch who is described as an edge witch watches over and guards these boundaries. Edge witches learn to think fast because the edges can shift so quickly. It also hones senses that people never knew they had, such as second sight and third thoughts. On their heads fall the fates of all they have in their care, a charge no one would ask for, but no true edge witch would ever refuse. They are quite possibly the most powerful of all the witches, if not in terms of raw magical power, as I believe that distinction belongs to the fairy godmothers, than in what they can accomplish and are expected to accomplish. They are often the primary defence for their steadings and indeed their whole areas, against things like elf incursions and other threats. Finally, we have the rarest of witches, the fairy godmothers, mentioned before. A witch charged with the care of one single person rather than a village or a community. This person is typically a princess, lost heir, or similar fated person whose life demands they go through dire or at the very least rather uncomfortable times. A godmother will have a deep understanding of human nature, making the good ones very kind, but the wicked ones very powerful. Indeed, godmothers are the witches most dangerous when they go cackling, as they will simply cease to play their roles in the stories, but instead will try to create and manipulate stories of their own. One such, Lilith de Temskiri, was able to enthrall the entire city of Genua in her bid to make the stories go as she wished to see them. What makes the godmother so powerful is their possession of wands. A magical artifact, a wand will allow one to access much more powerful transformation magic than any practitioner would normally have access to, transforming people, animals, vegetables and miscellaneous objects with ease into anything else, as dictated by the series of selector rings around the wand's length, although the older ones do have a tendency to rest to pumpkin if they are left without regular use. And to round out, we will go over the small but deeply interesting note of male witches. Unlike wizards, men just can't be witches. This is not down to some bizarre gender politics or what have you, or the casual misogyny that we see in older wizards who simply dismiss women. No, this is more down to, once again, our old friend Narrativium. Men can have the natural talent witches do, but their lives will be drawn into different paths where they have the same effect on the community, but providing in a different way. Most commonly you will see these men as beekeepers, blacksmiths, or landlords of the most local kind of local pub. Not any old bar thrown up in the city, you understand, or the pub established by a retiring man seeking to live his life quietly, but the real old inns that have been there for as long as the village itself, where everyone in the community knows to go, and where the publican is always willing to listen and give his vague, if encouraging, advice. Some of these men hold their strange gifts hereditarily, in fact, the most notable being the blacksmith of Lankra. The smith of Lankra has the ability to shoe anything, any animal, no matter what it might be or what its temperament is, but this does come at a cost, that the smith of Lankra must shoe whatever is brought to him, be it an ant or a unicorn or anything in between. Indeed, every few years, the blacksmith finds himself knowing just instinctively that a customer will be coming in the night, and so he waits with a blindfold on waiting for a rider all in black who brings a pale horse to receive its new set of shoes. 
And with that, I believe we've come to the end of everything that needs to be covered significantly about the witches and the use of their magic. If there's anything you've heard in this video that you'd like me to go into more detail on, do leave it in a comment below. Thank you once again to the Discord community for helping me put this video together. And if you'd like to see more, do like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.